So Russia, you know them, currently acting like if a honey badger was a country. Their central bank has been considering an outright ban on crypto, and their second richest man, presumably seen here, has a scheme to displace it entirely. This is because they should be worried, very worried about crypto. Both of these actions would have major ramifications on the price of crypto, but you know, Russia's gonna Russia. Since the war in Ukraine, there's been pressure on major exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken to block all wallet addresses in the former Soviet state. So why would we wanna block something that a country is already considering blocking? Add that to the bizarre Bitcoin rally that occurred after sanctions on Russia were enacted, and you have a bit of mystery here as to who crypto helps and who it hurts during wartime, the answer of which might surprise you. So let's unpack this by going back in time to a few weeks ago. When the Bank of Russia announced it had approved the first issuer of digital asset-backed tokens to a company called Atomize, which sounds a lot like an Ant-Man villain, but okay. Following the announcement, Russian oligarch Vladimir Potanin, presumably seen here, said that these tokens, essentially NFTs tied to real-world assets like precious metals and real estate, would displace the crypto industry entirely, and Atomize would use blockchain technology to do it. I wanted to understand more about the scope of his claims, because tokenized investments aren't necessarily new. Now, there are plenty of projects who have created NFTs tied to real-world goodies. But Potanin is the second richest man in Russia, and his private investment firm, Interos, which sounds like a Captain America villain, holds majority stakes in metals, energy, finance, real estate, and other industries that make up the backbone of Russia's economy. He has a lot of pull. He could hypothetically dual-wield Interos industrial assets and atomize to corner Russian retail investors. Much like China, Russia has this weird love-hate relationship with crypto. In January, their central bank proposed an outright ban on mining and transactions. But then regulators have also proposed regulations and taxation to capitalize on the trend instead. I mean, Putin himself isn't against Russians owning and using crypto and wants to find a compromise, which by my estimation is the first time he's ever wanted one of those. But I don't want to say that this is good news exactly. All bets are off at this point. But taking Russia out of the equation would starve the market of billions in crypto transactions annually. And an outright ban would eliminate the third largest Bitcoin mining country in the world. That'd be like starting a company that manufactures diabetes and then banning the United States. It doesn't make sense. And it's a little ironic that without the ban on crypto, Russia's in a better position than most other countries to benefit from its actual success. But an oligarch like Patanin, one of many that are in the Kremlin's pocket, seems to have a lot of incentive to take Russian retail investing and point it squarely at the businesses of the top 1%. And there's a precedent for all of this. When China banned crypto in the middle of last year, Bitcoin's price only dropped by about 6%. Before that, it was home to over 50% of all mining activity. That didn't hurt the market as much as some thought it would. So Russia exiting the industry probably wouldn't end up doing very much long-term damage. The fact is that sanctions against Russia have put a ban on crypto almost completely out of the question. This is a double-edged sword for Putin. The Russian ruble has fallen to almost half of its value in just over a week. Just picture that. Half of your money, gone. And unfortunately for many citizens of the country, many of whom oppose the war, crypto is a last resort for any savings to be salvaged. And the pro-government cronies running the majority of Russian businesses are being hit the hardest. Despite crypto exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken refusing to block all wallet addresses in Russia, the US government is working with them to prevent blacklisted businesses and individuals from using crypto to dodge sanctions. The aftermath brought about by Putin's war of choice inadvertently has given regular people in Russia something of an upper hand, you know, if you can call it that. I mean, they're not celebrating in the street about it. They're not like, we live in a tyrannical oligarchy run by this power mad shirtless horse rider and we're on the brink of nuclear war but at least we got the upper hand on crypto you know but as crypto exchanges have become the last area of the financial system that hasn't collapsed, regular people are buying in and regime fundraisers are getting blocked out. I'll explain why Russia should be really worried, but first, the topic of war. The sanctions imposed on Russia haven't stopped Putin from pressing on with the invasion of Ukraine. He's like a Black Friday shopper. You can put up barriers, but you bet he's gonna try and get that flat screen TV. Some analysts have pointed out that Russia actually did change their plans accordingly after anticipating that sanctions were coming, which not rocket science. If you decide to invade another nation, there will probably be consequences, unless you're Saudi Arabia. So in a, in a nutshell, Putin leveraged the country's massive oil and gas industry to create this stockpile of foreign currency that could be used to buy back the ruble and battle the sell pressure created by sanctions, but that didn't work. 
As part of the increasingly more severe sanctions, Russia has also been frozen out of their international reserves, 60% of which are in US dollars. So there's a growing concern that without access to foreign money, Russia could instead find ways to fund the weakening war effort through crypto sources. But that doesn't mean that if you've been buying the dip, no, sorry, not that dip, you're voting DA on the war with Ukraine. Crypto is more difficult to trace compared to money that goes through traditional banking systems, but it's not impossible. They could use the same crypto forensics that led to the DOJ seizing billions in Bitcoin, taking down TikTok, Bonnie, and Clyde. They could use those same forensics to figure out who is sending money to sanction Russian addresses. And if all else fails, they could probably just have CoffeeZilla figure this all out. <laughs> to this end, Coinbase, Kraken, FTX, and many other exchanges have in the last week committed to helping the US freeze out the Russian elite. Ray Dalio, the founder of the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates, recently posted a video on how empires rise and fall effectively changing, sometimes very quickly and sometimes very violently, which nation rules all others. I found it fascinating. He discusses how the longevity of some of the biggest empires in the last 500 years have all gone through the same pattern of achieving global dominance, but inevitably losing it. I know, Ray, I've, I've played Risk before. But what's interesting about this is that he talks about some health indicators that tell us how good or bad an empire is doing. And one sign of collapse is an increasing disparity between rich and poor, which apparently happens again and again when a more powerful economy keeps getting more powerful. Those who are in charge make off with the profits of global trade while well, wages remain stagnant. I know, right? I've played Monopoly. <laughs> so unless peaceful methods of redistribution happen, like the New Deal in 1933, the end result seems to always be a violent regime change. Russia, though not the dominant global power it once was, has struggled with a growing wealth gap. Like 500 people rule Russia, as has the Netherlands and Sweden and the USA and Thailand and Brazil and Denmark and the Philippines and India. It's almost as if the whole world is unequal. But in Russia, it's actually one of the main reasons their government proposed to ban crypto earlier this year. Russia is a notorious country for cracking down on political dissent, labeling opposition to the Putin regime as undesirable organizations. It turns out that of the $92 billion in crypto assets currently in Russian wallets, a growing fraction of this is being used to fund opposition and independent media. Today, Russian media has been barred from citing any other sources in their reporting apart from the government itself. But now that the war cat's out of the bag, well, putting a gag on crypto would be a death sentence to their economy or what's left of it. Now, it's not a guarantee that this will all end in a civil war within Russia like we see in Ray Dalio's examples. But with the ruble in free fall and sanctions stopping anyone in the oligarchy from turning this crisis around, crypto will do more for the average Russian person than it will the autocracy. Once upon a time, Vladimir Putanin could have convinced you that his company's new digital assets would become more valuable than Bitcoin, but his countrymen have proved him wrong. On the back of this insane war, crypto is one of the last financial systems that all Russia Russians and Ukrainians are relying on for the future. In Russia and Ukraine, private citizens have turned to crypto as this kind of safe haven against the pressures that war has put on their currency and their savings. This is why Russia should be worried. The thing empowering their citizens and Ukrainians most is the same thing that they need to attempt to use to curb sanctions. This one tweet perfectly summarizes the situation. When your centralized financial system collapses, your best bet is having money in decentralized assets. So during wartime, the citizens in Russia and Ukraine need crypto now more than ever. And we're in a better spot than ever to make sure that crypto helps those who need it and hinders those who want to exploit it for political dominance. Ah!